Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Dave Frankowski and I'll be your moderator for today's class. And welcome to another lecture given by the Oceanside California class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958, and we hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside class was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside class, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the President, Dr. Carl Emler. Now in the school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name for our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It's a divine title because it's the title that our creator has chosen for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. And a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, the limits and the bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud, because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of this chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body, and he walked the earth plane as Yahshua, the Messiah, who the whole world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what did they call the Savior when he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface 
to the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one in the wilderness of Sinai, exactly like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men, whereby a man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Frank DeMassey from our Syracuse, New York class. And we'll have a scripture read, which will be Acts, the 20th chapter. And that'll be read by Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside, California class. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Let us all take this moment, settle ourselves down, bow our hearts and minds, and let us get in that special place within our hearts that we can communicate with our Heavenly Father. Dear Father, Yahweh, thank you for allowing us one more opportunity to stand before and to testify of this glorious gospel. May it be your will that each and every one of us that are earshot of this gospel realize and understand that we have been divinely invited to hear this gospel and understand and know Yahweh's purpose. Let us always appreciate and understand the stability that we have is not of our own. It's been placed in us by his mercy and by his grace. And let each and every one of us never, ever see a day where we don't love the truth and we don't care and love one another. We ask this in the name of Yahshua. May we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good afternoon, class. Today, I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trena 
of the Scripture Research Association Incorporated in College Park, Maryland. Acts 20. And after the uproar was ceased, Saul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go unto Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much, much exhortation, he came unto Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, he was about to sail into Syria. He purposed to return through Macedonia and there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and of Asia, Tychius and Trophimus. And going, sorry, these going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them in Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Saul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Saul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Saul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves for this, his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day. So he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. And we went before the ship and sailed to Assos. And they're, they're intending to take in Saul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, he, we took him in and came to Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogladium, and the next day we came to Miletus. For Saul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time, the time in Asia, for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the congregation. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving Yahweh with all humility of mind, and with many tears and hard trials which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance towards Yahweh and faith towards our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save that the Holy Spirit witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of Yahshua the Messiah to testify the evangel of the grace of Yahweh. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of Yahweh, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of Yahweh. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the congregation of Yahshua, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, 
grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to Yahweh and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of Yahshua the Messiah, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept exceedingly and fell on Saul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Acts, the 20th chapter. Thank you, Dr. Geller and Dr. DeMassey. Our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Linda Volpe from our Oceanside, California class and Dr. Gail Josephson from our Green Bay, Wisconsin class. Speakers, please be advised, you'll see a five-minute sign appear on your screen. Please acknowledge when you've seen the sign. And our first speaker this afternoon will be the Dean of our Green Bay, Wisconsin class, Dr. Andy Verkaterin. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> It's definitely always a great honor and privilege to have anything to say about Yahshua and his purpose and plan. Um, I just think back of all the years uh, of attending this teaching. And I say this teaching for a specific reason because this teaching, when I refer to that, is the teaching that our founder brought to this organization as a result of a divine vision and revelation. And he never ever expected somebody to just take his word for it because he said it, he never asked to be praised. He didn't want his name on, on things. He didn't want his name to be on the name of the Institute or anything like that. He, he wasn't looking for glory for, for himself. You know, and he's the one that took the time to put together a lot of these aims and the very first aim is this, of this institute is to help you. And I didn't know I needed help. It's to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. That is our goal, is to get you to see something about our creator. That, first of all, he is real. He does exist. Um, <clears throat> and there's a re re reward of them that diligently seek him. Um, so there is a, a something that you can gain by, you know, by coming down here all these years. And one of the cool, the coolest things is, well, first of all, everything that I've learned here, <clears throat> I have not heard or have been taught these things in my Christian upbringing. You know, and I don't know what everyone else heard in their Christian upbringing, but I started out as a Roman Catholic. And then I went to my grandmother's Lutheran church for for a while, and then I ended up being confirmed Methodist, and I came down here to basically save my brother. I wasn't coming down here to make friends or anything like that. I came down here to try to prove this thing wrong. You, you know, not that I was an expert on God or anything like that, but I wasn't coming down here to find religion or something like that. And when I heard this teaching for my first time, it really caught me off guard because I've never, ever been to an organization where, you know, the preacher from the pulpit would say, you know, don't take my word for it. You would check it out for yourself. You know, and one of the first things we tell you in this school is that the name of the creator is Yahweh. Now, when I heard that for my first time, my church upbringings, both in my Catholic 
Now, I was, I went to a Catholic church when I was a young man that had to be back in the 60s and the 70s, part of the 70s. And then the Lutheran church in the 70s and Methodist church also in the 70s. So at that time, I had never heard the name Yahweh or Yahshua. And when, um, when it was presented to me, it wasn't just presented to me in a fashion like just, just take our word for it. You know, they wanted us to go check it out. So, you know, obviously when I went home, I didn't sleep well that night um, because it caused me to toss and turn quite a bit. And then the next day I went down to the Brown County Library because that's the library that's in our county of Brown and City of Green Bay is in Brown County. Uh, I looked up in so many reference sources and every reference source I looked, it verified that in fact the name given to Moses back there at Mount Sinai at the burning bush was Yahweh. <clears throat> None of them said it wasn't. They all confirmed it was. My question is, why wasn't I taught that church? And why wasn't it important in church? And the more I did my investigation with that, you know, we come to find out that Yahweh is the one that said, this is my name forever in Exodus 3.15 at the burning bush. When Moses said, hey, Yahweh, what, hey, God, what's your name? He said, my name is Yahweh. And he said that this is my name forever. And this isn't what Moses said. This is what your creator Yahweh said. This is my name forever. And it's my memorial unto all generations. He made a Ten Commandment about that name. Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh and make in, in vain. And the word vain means to make something useless or worthless. He said, don't take my name and make it useless or worthless. Now, you can take the time, and this is a school, to look up the word vain, and you'll see it means to make useless or worthless. That's some of the definitions. So, and then he says in Psalms, my name shall continue as long as the sun, you know, and the sun's still shining in the sky. Yahweh never said that, it, you know, that, you know, don't call me Yahweh. It, it, that's his name. It's the truth. That name is holy. The name's holy. And, you know, for, for having those names revealed to me, it really, really put me in a spot where it caused me to go into a serious meditation. And obviously I came back to hear more. And we strongly encourage people that come to this teaching that you should definitely attend. Um, you know, give it, give it at least three classes, you know, and, and really check this thing out, you know, and, and, you know, and then, it was a matter of time when I started hearing lectures on the names and then somebody was explaining to me about the tabernacle pattern and then learning about how the law and prophets, that Old Testament is pointing out, Yahshua, all these things. I've never, ever seen anything like that in my upbringing, never. And I've been a prisoner ever since because I don't know, I can't refute it. I, I you know, and, and the thing that really boggles my mind is why would somebody be upset with us for telling you the truth and that's what's happening sometimes when we bring this teaching to somebody they are so ingrained in the philosophies and the thought process of of the world that you know be careful you know it's a cult or you know all this type of stuff and um they don't even take the time to investigate these things to see whether or not they're true and correct you know, and so what I wanted to talk a little about a little bit is, you know, we'll keep it basic because I know there's people in here that maybe are hearing some of this information for the first time. And maybe uh, there are people down here that have been here for, for, for many, many years, longer than me. And um, let's go to Isaiah 8 and 20. <clears throat> Isaiah 8 and 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Okay. Now, can we pick up the, the verse above that, maybe? Yep. 19. 
And when they shall say, I'll pick it up at 18. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts, which dwells in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their Elohim for the living to the dead? And there's people that seek all kinds of unusual things, but shouldn't they be seeking your creator? But read. 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So it's really clearly is how we should be being taught. And it says to the law and to the testimony. Now, before I came down here, I knew what the law was only because as a Methodist, being confirmed Methodist, I had to memorize the books of the law. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those first five books uh, were the law. And then you have the books from Joshua to Malachi, which makes up the rest of the Old Testament. So I knew what the Old Testament was to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. And some margins and Bibles will say for light, there's no revelation of truth in them. In other words, they're just not speaking the truth. And in my religious upbringing, they told me that the name of the Savior is Jesus. But you know what? They never went to the law and proved that to me. They never went to the testimony and proved that to me. You know, they told me the name of God is, you know, the creator is God. You know, they never, you know, and, and the only thing they used is they would go to your Bible and say, see, it says God in your Bible. It says the Lord in your Bible. It says Jesus in your, but, but they never, you know, I didn't know that the Bible had mistakes in it. I didn't know that. I thought the Bible was infallible and all this type of stuff, but. There's a lot of mistakes in your Bible. The biggest one is they took those names out of there and they put titles in replace of it and, and substituted names that just, they're just not true. But to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. So what do we do? We, we go to the law and we try to show you this first five books where Moses was shown the name of Yahweh. And that Yahweh said, this is my name forever. That's in the law. This is my memorial unto all generations. That's in the law. Don't take my name in vain or make it useless. That's in the law. And in Psalm 72, 17, my name shall continue as long as the sun. That's in the prophets. So when we present these names, we're doing it to the law and to the testimony. Because we're not giving you darkness. We're giving you the true light, the true uh, 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 the reality of what Yahweh's name is that, you know, and our first name is to help you find and know Yahweh as what he really is and actually exists. His name is Yahweh. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy. And, and we could do that with every one of the aspects of this teaching. You know, we want to talk about the tabernacle pattern. We go to the law and show you um, <clears throat> back there with Moses, how that tabernacle was shown to Moses on top of Mount Sinai when he went to the divided waters of the Red Sea with the children of Israel, and they went and camped about Mount Sinai. And then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Dubai were invited up to the mountain. This is on the second trip. And then when he's up there on the second trip on the mountain, this is Exodus 24 chapter. In Exodus the 25th chapter, you see that Moses has shown this tabernacle pattern. We show you how this is a pattern in the law. And then we go and show you in the prophets that David was shown by his hand, Yahweh's hand upon his body, all the works in this pattern. And we, did we even go into the fulfillment and show you in Hebrews that this tabernacle was a, an example and a shadow of heavenly things. So even when we present the tabernacle, we're going to the law and we're going to the prophets to bring that out. It's the same thing when we talk about Yahshua. Everything Yahshua said, everything Yahshua did is witnessed by that law and prophets. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's just see how important witnesses are in the law. Let's go to, uh, uh, because someone might think, well, you know, and I remember getting in debate with um with a baptist one time 
And I was trying to show him how that Yahshua was witnessed, was, was fulfilling a lot of things that were written in Law and Prophets. And he thought I was being a doubting Thomas because I wasn't just taking it on faith. In other words, he was expecting me to just accept Jesus in my heart on blind faith. And, and Jesus is going to reward me for accepting him in my heart on blind faith. But that's not Yahshua or the creator never, you know, required man to just take his word for it blindly. Let's go to Deuteronomy 19 and 15. And now this is in the law. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or mm -hmm. for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So if we show you in the law two or three places that the name is important, that matter should be established. It should be over. You know, and is somebody going to go to law and tell me how Yahweh doesn't care what you call them? I want to see that one. You know, uh, you know, they'll, they'll still come up with all kinds of concepts and ideas to justify why they think that it's okay to use whatever they want to use to address their creator. But, you know, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a matter be established. Now, that's in the law. Now, also in the law, you have the example with Moses. Before Moses went down um, to uh, uh, Pharaoh to deliver the uh, children of Israel from bondage, he had some questions uh, to the Creator. And let's go to Exodus 4 and start at 1. Exodus 4 and 1. Mm -hmm. And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, Yahweh Elohim hath not appeared unto thee. And it's the same thing with us when we try to present this teaching, this teaching to other people in the world. You know, how are they going to believe us? Mm -hmm. What are we going to use to try to persuade somebody that what we're trying to tell you is the truth and what you've been told your whole life is, is not right? And Moses is kind of addressing the same thing. You know, I go down to Israel or, you know, or Egypt. They're not going to believe me, but read. And Yahweh said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And What's in said, your hand? Like, really, Yahweh didn't know what Moses had in his hand? Of course he did. <laughs> but this is just, you know, after the fact, it's being written in the book. What is that in your hand? Read. And he said, a rod. Mm -hmm. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it mm -hmm. became a serpent. Mm -hmm. And Moses fled from before it. Now, and here's the thing is, did Moses have the ability to change that rod into a serpent? Absolutely not. He couldn't do that. I mean, uh, so he fled from it, you know, because the creator of the universe, one of the definitions of the name Yahweh, and the name Yahweh has uh, several different meanings but one of them is he who causes to exist or to be and he's the one that caused that rod to become a serpent and then keep reading for and yahweh said unto moses put forth thine hand and and take it by the tail and he mm -hmm. put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand so in other words, Yahweh was able to cause that rod to turn into a serpent and then also turn it back into a rod. But read. That they may believe that Yahweh Elohim of their fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the whole point of that was that they would believe him. Because an ordinary man can't do that kind of a thing. But keep reading. And Yahweh said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Mm -hmm. So and now, now, now he's putting his hand in his bosom. It's coming out and his hand is leprous. You know a diseased hand, and then keep reading. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again. 
and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. The whole point of what Moses was getting was witnesses to cause Egypt to believe that he was really addressing or bringing forth the real creator of the universe. And that's what we're trying to do down here is trying to get you to see the real Yahweh. You know, and this school is called the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. Meta Metaphysical means beyond the physical. It's trying to get you to see things that are happening behind the scenes. In other words, what is it that's causing that rod to turn into a serpent? What is it that's causing that hand to become leprous? What is it that's causing that hand to be healthy again and the rod that was a serpent that turned back? What 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 underlying thing or 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 deity, which is really Yahweh, is driving this purpose and it's full of those types of examples everywhere and the whole point of it is to try to get you to see that Yahweh is real he does exist there's a way to verify those types of things and that's with Moses now you know and there's two examples in the law now we can go to the prophets and we can go um let's get um um uh prove all things i'm trying to think where that is off the top of my head in thessalonians first thessalonians 5 21 okay that's not what i want let's go to gideon let's go to judges uh six chapter uh verses 36 through 40. now in this particular case you know, uh, Yahweh was working with Gideon and, you know, whether or not he would be able to, you know, uh, prevail over the Midianites and the Amalek, Amalekites. And so Gideon is asking Yahweh for witnesses here. And that's, this is what the story is picking up. So pick it up at Judges 6.36. And Gideon said unto Yahweh, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside it, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. So and here's the thing. He's going to put a fleece on the floor, and, you know, if, if there's dew... Uh, uh, well, I will put the read 37 again. I'm sorry. I will put I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only and it be dry upon all the earth beside it, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand as thou hast said. So here again, if if the fleece is wet and all the floor is dry, the question is, well, how the heck did this fleece get wet? And it's again trying to get you to see there's something behind the scenes that this Yahweh is driving his purpose and causing Gideon's situation. He's giving Gideon proof or witnesses to his question, but go ahead and read and it was so, for he rose up early on the next day and thrust the fleece together and wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Mm -hmm. And Gideon said unto Yahweh, let not thy anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me, let me make a trial, I pray thee, but this once more with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground, let there be dew. So it's the opposite. Now... You know, now let the opposite conditions. Before the ground was dry, the fleece was wet, but now he's asking for the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. Read. And Yahweh did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Mm -hmm. Then Jeroboam, Jeroboam 
Sarah? That's good. That's good. Oh, okay. See, now Gideon wanted witnesses or he wanted proof to give him, you know, to, you know, to help him understand whether or not what what Yahweh is asking him to do is, is real or not real. I mean, your creator is not going to be upset with you for asking proof. He's not going to be throwing in your face, oh, just stop being the doubting Thomas because Yahweh didn't get angry with Gideon. He didn't get angry with Moses. And both of them, it was important that they would have witnesses so that they could believe this thing, so they could truly believe um, that um, it's okay to get witnesses. As a matter of fact, it's very important to get witnesses because if you don't get witnesses, witnesses are what allow you to be convinced of things. You know, and that's why it says in Thessalonians 5.21, let's get that. First Thessalonians 5 and 21, mm -hmm. prove, all, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. It says prove some things. No, it says prove all things. You know, if you really think that the name of the, you know, the Savior was originally Jesus, prove it to me. Prove to me, because I can prove to you it wasn't. And people would get mad at us for trying to give them the proof and to give you witnesses to maybe liberate you from ignorance, to give you something that you can really know for sure. Now, um, so, so the thing is that witnesses are important. Witnesses are used to help convince um, things of whether Yahweh is real. Let's go to Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6. Mm -hmm. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to Yahweh must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now here it says, without faith, it's impossible to please Yahweh. For he that comes to Yahweh, you, you must believe that he is. You're not going to go out, you worship a creator that you don't even know if he's real or not. And when it says, uh, 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 when you're talking about faith, you know, faith is an attribute. It's, it's a fruit. It's a fruit of the spirit. And it's a fruit that, you know, someone might think, well, you just got to have more faith. Well, faith is a fruit of your creator. It's, we can get it Galatians. Uh, uh, let's get Galatians. I think it's five and, oh. I don't remember where everything is, but I know what's in there. Around 22. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Galatians 5 and 22. Mm -hmm. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So faith is a fruit of the spirit. So does that mean that you have the ability to, to, to have your own faith? And you're going to find out that, you know, let's go to John 15 and, and, and 1. And we're going to just address this right now of whether or not you can grow your own fruit. Um, uh, start reading at 1 real quick, please. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Mm -hmm. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now watch the way Yash was addressing me, this. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, and every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he... Well, go ahead and read. Uh... Uh, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, at, that it may bring forth more fruit. Mm -hmm. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Read. Abide in me, and I in you. Mm -hmm. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it Did abide you catch that? I do see the five minutes. Did you catch that? The branch cannot. Did you hear that? The branch cannot bear fruit on its own. So in other words, you cannot bear fruit on your own 
unless you abide in Yahshua. In other words, you need to have Yahshua in you to truly bear fruit. You can't do it on your own. Your fruit ain't good. It, it ain't going to be right. It ain't the right fruit because the branch cannot bear fruit on its own. You're not the vine. You're the branch. And we need to understand that. So um, I did see the five-minute sign. So what I want to do is in closing, I'm going to continue on to just try to show a little bit more of the metaphys metaphysical uh, phenomena that's going on even back here with Yahshua when he's on the cross. Let's go to John, the 19th chapter. And we'll get a couple of these out. Uh, let's start reading John 19. Now, this is when they put Yahshua on the cross. And I just want to show you... Um, um, we start reading at 19 and 1. This is where, you know, they're putting a crown of thorns on, you know, on Yahshua's head. Let's just start reading at 1. And Pilate therefore took Yahshua and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Now, here's the thing. Now, watch what's going on. These soldiers and Pilate. They're not bibliomaniacs. They're not studying the scriptures to see what we need to do to Yahshua so that Yahshua can fulfill having a crown of thorns. They're being mean to him. And they're putting a crown of thorns on his head. But it just so happens that that's according to Yahweh's purpose that he causes the soldiers to do that. Because, Yah, again, just like Yahweh behind the scene is causing the fleece to be wet or the fleece to be dry, Yahweh behind the scene is causing Moses' hand to be leprous or not leprous, or the rod to be a serpent or not a serpent, causing these soldiers to put a crown of thorns on his head so that Yahshua can fulfill Adam, who's going to reap thorns and thistles by the sweat of his brow, so he can fulfill the ram that's caught in the thickets with Abraham and Isaac, so he can fulfill the weeds wrapped around Jonah's head, you know, when he was in the fish's belly. So they're putting, you see, they're not thinking of the scriptures when they're doing this. It's Yahweh driving his purpose. Now let's um, drop down to four. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Now why did Pilate say he found no fault in Yahshua? Again, he's not, Pilate's not reading the Bible thinking, oh, man, this lamb can't have any spot and blemish, or Daniel can finally have no fault with Daniel back in the prophets. He's not doing this. It's Pilate finds no fault with him because, again, it's the metaphysical. It's behind the physical. It's Yahweh, the creator of the universe, driving his purpose, is causing Pilate, who has knows nothing about, he's not cool here, say, look, he's not, Yahshua's not coming up to Pilate saying, Pilate, Please don't find any fault with me because I got to fulfill this. No, that's not what's happening. This is happening. It's a metaphysical event. I find no fault with them to fulfill not having any fault with the land. Now let's go. Uh, let's go to uh, the sixth verse. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Pilate said unto them. Take ye him and crucify him, for I find now, no fault. Now, we know that there was a time they were given between two people. They could pick between Yahshua and Barabbas. Now, here's Yahshua changing water into wine, causing a dead man to, to resurrect after four days and healing so many people. And now, all of a sudden, the assembly later says, we want Barabbas, crucify Yahshua. Well, again... What's driving the force of Yahshua fulfilling that the whole assembly, the whole assembly had to offer up that lamb and kill in the evening. And, and again, it's the assembly that's causing Yahshua to be crucified. It's a metaphysical. You were, they're not reading scripture to think, well, what, what should Yahshua fulfill next? And then, you know, it goes on. Now here, let's just go to the 17th verse. We're going to get these last couple and then I'll be down. I'm just trying to get you to see Yahweh's real. Read. 17, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, 
mm-hmm. which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. Mm-hmm. When they crucified him, or where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Yahshua in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Yahshua of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Oh, no, let's drop down to 28. I'm not going to have time to work with that. We'll do 28 and then um, 32. That's the only two I'll be able to do. 28. After this, Yahshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now watch this. Here's Yahshua's on the cross. And he knowing that now all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said what? I thirst. So what happens? Did they give him water? No. They gave him vinegar upon hyssop. Why? Because it's not like the person that was giving him vinegar on hyssop was read the Bible thinking, we got to get some bitter herbs up here for Yahshua. No, it's a metaphysical event happening with people who are non-believers of Yahshua. So they give him vinegar upon hyssop. So what happens? The vinegar in some cases is mixed with gall, with gall, which is extremely bitter. So it's again, it's something that's happening that's metaphysical. Now, now verse 32. Two. Mm-hmm. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahshua and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. So they should have broke Yahshua's legs. But the Roman centurion, again, he's not a bibliomaniac. Looking back there, it's a metaphysical event. Yahweh is causing the soldier to change his mind and doesn't break Yahshua's legs. And he pierces him in the side. Well, thank you. The lamb back there had to be pierced in the side. So again, what I'm trying to get you to see is that Yahweh's real. He is the driving force behind this purpose. And it doesn't matter whether you believe this teaching or not. We're all prisoners of it. You know, and hopefully, you know, that, you know, coming to this class that you can learn some things about Yahweh, he really does exist and he really has a purpose. He really has a plan. And I am so thankful that he's revealed things to me that hopefully someone got something out of what I said. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Verkaterin. And our next speaker this afternoon will be the Dean of our Syracuse, New York class, Dr. Patrick Trevison. Good evening. Good evening. I, uh, I enjoyed that and I was stimulated and I will uh, say to uh, carry on with what has been laid down before me. Uh, I want to go to the scripture reading and work with that, but just just a part of it. And uh, let's go to... The 16th verse, read 16, uh, down to 21. Okay, Acts 20 and 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hastened, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So he wants to get back to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. But he wants to stop in Ephesus. Now, your epistles that are in your book, Ephesians, were written as a result of what Paul experienced in his trips to Ephesus, which is which was in uh, what was then Asia Minor or Anatolia but is modern-day Turkey now on the shore, Ephesus, was a class there. So go ahead, continue to read. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. 
And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Now you know from, from the first time that I came to you, because this is part of Asia Minor, see? You know what I have done since I first came here. The things I have taught. Go ahead and read. Serving Yahweh with all humility of mind and with many tears and trials which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So he taught them publicly and from house to house. And he did so boldly, even though there were some Jews who lay in wait, or in other words, they did all kinds of things to try to uh, throw Paul in jail and hire thugs to beat him up and do all kinds of things because they did not like what he was teaching. And what he was teaching was the same thing that Andy was teaching tonight. How Yahshua died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was teaching the gospel. The gospel of Yahshua. And he held nothing back. And he did it using the correct names, Yahshua. He never, never once, not ever, used the name of Jesus. Not ever. That's a lie. Now go ahead and read. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward Yahweh and faith toward our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Now, he was testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks, or, in other words, to the Gentiles. Faith mm -hmm. towards Yahweh. Faith. Because it's a new covenant now. And it's not of works. It's of faith. And it's by grace. And there's nothing you can do with your hands to worship your creator. Read, please. 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. All right. Now, uh, I want you to read 27 and and then I'm going to I'm going to come back to this, but read 27 and we'll stop um, for now. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of Yahweh. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel or wisdom or knowledge of Yahweh. He taught them everything he could. Everything. Now, we're going to go to Romans the first chapter, and start reading in 15 for me, if you would. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, this is Paul again, and he's teaching the people that are at the class in Rome, Italy. Paul got along around <laughs> pretty good. In, that, in the ancient world, around the Mediterranean was pretty much where everything was going on. You can see part of it here. And you can see Rome there in Italy. And you can see uh, Ephesus there where Turkey juts out. You can see the the dots there, Ephesus was there. Over here, 
was Ephesus. You can't see where my pen is at pointing. <laughs> 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 but my point is, Paul went to Paul ended up going to Rome. Peter ended up going to Babylon. And John went to in, up into the Aegean to the Isle of Patmos. So John went to the middle of, of the man. Peter went to the head of the man. And Paul went to the feet of the man. This Man is like a pattern. In other words, they preach the gospel in every part of the ancient world. Every part of the ancient world. So here is Paul now, and he's teaching them. He's writing them this letter who have a class in Rome. Read, please. 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation. To no, every he, said, he said over there in the 20th chapter, he said, I have not shunned to teach you anything because he taught them everything that he could. And here he's saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua. I'm not ashamed of it. He was proud of it. And as Andy said, he was a prisoner of it. And there's several places in his epistles where he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Yahshua, the prisoner of the God doctrine, the prisoner of the truth, the prisoner of the gospel. Read, please. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jew and also to the Gentiles. Read. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of Yahweh is revealed from faith to faith. Now go back and, and start reading it again because I missed something. Okay, um, 15. So as much as me is, in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. Now, I'm going to stop there for one second, and we got to go over to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and start reading in 1. First Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15.1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now he's going to declare the people who are in Corinth, which was another class, which was in Greece. He's going to declare to them the gospel. This is the gospel. This isn't the gospel of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John as it says in your Bible, which is a mistake in your Bible. As Andy said, there's a lot of mistakes in the Bible, but you can, put, you can correct the mistakes that are in the Bible by the Bible. Read, please. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and in which ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Now if this gospel will save you. It will save you. It's not me saying that. It's not Oceanside class saying that. This is Paul saying this full of the Holy Spirit. Read. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Unless if you, you keep believe. it in memory. 
Don't forget it. Don't cast it aside. Don't think it's not important anymore. Don't think it's old fashioned and you got to move on to something new and juicy. You got to keep this in memory, Reed. Unless you have believed in vain. Unless you believed to, for no purpose. Uh, you, you brought it to naught. You've made it empty. You've made it meaningless. You, you don't do that. It's got to become an integral part of you. It's got to become a part of your soul. Read. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Yahshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures. How that Yahshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. How Yahshua died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And Andy showed you the scriptures are the law, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, the next 34 books. From Genesis all the way down to Matthew. That's the law and the prophets. That's the law and the prophets. Those are the witnesses that point to Yahshua. They point him out. They make him real. Read. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. That's the gospel. That's the doctrine. Now go back to where we were reading in Romans. 1 and 15. So as much as, as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I'm ready to preach this gospel to you. Read, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation. Well, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of salvation. He's saying again, this will save you. He's saying the same thing he said over there in Corinthians. It will save you. Read. To everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jew and the Gentile. Read. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. From faith to faith, which uh, I don't have time to explain right now, but we can explain these things. But real quickly, Abraham operated by faith way back, way back before the law was given to Moses. And then you had the Mosaic law for 1,500 years. And then you had the day of Pentecost when faith was poured out. You see the arrow down here on the bottom. Melchizedek priesthood, Abrahamic promise. There's an arrow. And then you see it. It's broken there. And there's the old covenant. And then the arrow is in the fourth age, present kingdom age, Pentecost, spirit law, New Testament. There's the arrow. Now it's by faith again. It went from faith to faith. All right, that's very quick. Go back again, please. Yep. Um, 17. 
for therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, the just in this covenant, folks, are going to have to live by faith. By faith. I'm sorry. Not by works. Not by works. Now, I would like to get, if we can, Mitch's three charts up, if you have them. It's all right. Just put the purpose, pattern, and plan chart up. That'll be good. He does have the Mitch's charts, though. This is okay for now, okay? Um, listen, these events that are on this chart, the chart of the pattern or plan of salvation. Uh, I'm going to pick a few of these stories and add a few stories that aren't on this chart but that are on Mitch's charts, but we don't have the time to get them right. Oh, there they are now. <laughs> uh, with, with the children of Israel, There was a death down in Egypt. There was the death of a lamb. If you could enlarge the plate for me, please. There we go. Migratory pattern, yes. This, I'm sorry, this is just taking too long. Can we go back to the purpose, pattern, and plan chart? I apologize. There we go. Now, the second plate from the left is, is the flood with Noah. There was a death of everyone in the world. Yahweh said that the death of all flesh had come before him, the end of all flesh, because the evil in men's minds was just continuous. It was just nothing but evil. And so he caused this flood to come on the earth the water came from below and above, and Noah, a preacher of righteousness, preached for 120 years. And then they got in that ark, and the doors were closed by the Holy Spirit. And there was a death of everyone. The whole earth was buried in water and the people in that ark resurrected life was in 
salvation was in that ark. That was the ark of salvation. You see the arrow pointing to it. And it was lifted. And it went into a brand new creation in that top plate. Where you see Mount Ararat on the left, which is where the ark rested. And you see the temple on the other mountain. And you see the rainbow in between. The rainbow was a token of the covenant which he made with Noah. He promised him that he would never again end the earth with water. So you have the old covenant with the ark and you have the new covenant with the ark in the sky or the rainbow or the two witnesses. There's two witnesses in the most holy place in all these plates, but I don't have time to break them all down. Now in the next plate, that's the migratory pattern. And there was a death of a lamb down in Egypt. It was all black. And they were, they were liberated from Egypt. When Moses went down there with that name of Yahweh, and it was the name, of, it was the power in the name of Yahweh that freed them, that brought them salvation, that liberated them. And I saw a thing today on uh, Netflix. It's a six-part series. It's part of World War II from the front lines. And it was when the Americans liberated the death camp, and I believe it was at Dachau, and my father was with those troops. And this one GI, he unlocked these steel doors on this factory, which was full of women, full of women. And the Nazis had wired this factory to blow up. But the fuse didn't, it didn't blow up. And so they were all in there and they were, many of them were dead. Many of them were still alive. Very gaunt, very feeble. And when he opened this door, this one woman said to him, thank you for liberating us. She said, but I'm Jewish. And the guy said to her, it took him a while. He gathered himself and he said, I'm Jewish too. And these people came out of that. It was a iron furnace. Like Egypt was des described in your book as the iron furnace. And those women came out of there and they were so appreciative of being liberated. All I could think of was this teaching, how liberating it was to be freed from my old concepts, my old theories, my old opinions, my old nature, and to be liberated from that and to be liberated from the world and to come up into the holy place. And what happened down there, there was the death of a lamb. And there was the death of the firstborn. And they were buried in the Red Sea. And they resurrected into a brand new 
place and they were free, free. They went from slavery to freedom. It, it was liberating. It shows that principle. This is physically speaking. It goes by a pattern, which is in the next plate. There's a death on that altar in the court roundabout. There's a burial in the labor which is the next vessel. And then there's a horn of holy anointing oil that was poured on the head of the priest that he would anoint or that he would uh, function in the holy place without making errors. He was quickened. And this correlates with your physical body, this tabernacle. And then... Let's take Jonah in the prophets. Jonah was told to go and preach the gospel to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. Uh, that, that's on the next play. Next, next one. You got it with David and Goliath. You got it with the, uh, oh my goodness, Daniel in the lion's den. You've, all of these, all of these events show the death and the burial and the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. And Jonah was cast into the Mediterranean Sea in a huge storm and the sailors cast him overboard and he was given up for dead here it is here next to the giant oh you had er, the man the next plate there's the plate there the third plate from the left and he was given up for dead and he went and a specially prepared fish snatched up Jonah and he was in that fish and went down in the depths and he was in that fish for three days and three nights and he cried out to Yahweh from the belly of hell and Yahweh brought that fish up to the top and he was released after three days and the sun was coming up in the morning. And it was a liberation. It was, a, you understand, the death, a burial, and a resurrection on the third. Now, we go over to Yahshua. Yahshua's resurrection, or, or crucifixion. That'll be, a, you know, he's he's brought before uh, Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate says, I, I find no fault in this man. And as Andy said, no bones of him could be broken because the bones are pointing to Yahshua's bride or the body, his body. No bones can be broken in the body of Yahshua. There can be no disruptions. There can be no breaking. It has to be whole. It has to be one. It has to be one. And now I have five minutes. But all, thank you. But all these events are pointing to Yahshua's death. He was put on that cross. He was buried in Joseph's new tomb. And he resurrected a spiritual body, a death, a burial, and a resurrection, which all these events pointed to. This is the gospel, folks. This is the gospel. And this will save you. It may sound silly. 
It may sound foolish, but this is what Paul taught at the beginning of this age. And it is the power of salvation for your soul. Now I want to go back to the scripture reading. Uh, and please start reading in 28. Acts 20 and 28. Yes, and, and read down to uh, 32, and I'll, and I'll be done. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. Now the flock, the flock is the body of Yah. We are the flock, folks. Yahshua is the shepherd, and we are the flock. And Paul is telling them, Take heed over the flock over which you are overseers. You are shepherds. Now there's good shepherds and there's bad shepherds. Read, please. To feed the assembly of Yahweh, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now you feed that assembly of Yahweh. You feed them with knowledge, with the gospel, with the truth. You teach them, teach them, as Paul did. Paul did constantly, and they hated him for it, for teaching the truth. And they're not going to like you for teaching the truth. Don't expect to win any popularity contests. Read, please. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. After my departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you. Or in other words, there's going to be people that are going to enter in very slowly, very subtly, very, very slick going to uh, start bringing back in those carnal ordinances and those physical ways of worship very slowly and very and start teaching things that are not this gospel you heard tonight and they're going to They're going to seduce silly women with cunningly devised fables, made up stories, and doctrine and gospels that are not this gospel, not this gospel of the kingdom. Read, please. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I've seen it happen right beside me. Read, please. Therefore watch and remember that for the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Therefore watch and be careful and discern and learn all you can learn. So you can discern the difference between a truth and a lie. And believe me, you want to stay and stand in this liberation. This air of freedom is wonderful. And we thank Yahshua for it. He did nothing to deserve it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Trippison. And for our third speaker this afternoon, we'll have the Dean of our Oceanside, California class, Dr. Dennis Volpe. I want to say good evening to everyone. And I want to just pick it right up from where uh, Rick had left off there, because that's exactly where I want to head with uh, this scripture that we read tonight. Now, 
It is vitally important that all of us come to the realization that Yahweh set up in his purpose two mysteries that are in operation, the mystery of righteousness and the mystery of iniquity. Now, the mystery of iniquity's job is to try to overturn and undermine the mystery of righteousness. Uh, his whole so-called motivation is to cause souls to be lost. As Dr. Kinley once said, that he wants to take as many souls as he can to the lake of fire with him. Now, Yahshua has been sent into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And this is what we have to understand. Both mysteries are in this purpose. One of them is disguised. The other one is hidden in a mystery as well. Uh, what we have to do is understand how Yahweh has set this purpose up by going back and seeing what has been laid down in the Law and the Prophets. Now, let's go back over for a minute. I want to go back to Deuteronomy. Hang on one minute here. I want to go to Deuteronomy, the 31st chapter, and I want to start at 16. Now, this is just before the people are about to cross over and Moses is about to be taken up into the mountain where he will uh, uh, expire and Joshua at that point, or Yahshua the son of Nun, will now take over the job of bringing the people into the land of Canaan or into their inheritance. Now, I want you to read what, what uh, Moses is telling these people here, right at that point where they're about to pass over from one state to another state. That is to say, from the wilderness to the land of Canaan. And we know that that is pointing to uh, the crossover, the Passover that all of us want to make down here at the end of this age. So go ahead and start reading at 16. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them and, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Now here Yahweh is telling Moses that they're going to not keep the covenant. They're going to break it. And they're going to do the very thing that Yahweh hated there uh, uh, that is spoken about with the Ten Commandments, they're going to worship false deities and idols and be caught up in idolatry. Now, uh, keep reading, please. 17. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will for forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our Elohim is not among us? And I will surely hide my face Go ahead. in that day for all the evils which they shall have brought, in that they are turned unto other Elohims. All right, now hold your point there because I, I know I don't have a lot of time to read the whole thing. So we're going to have to go down to, all right, go, go down for a minute and read also 21. Um, Deuteronomy 31, 21. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seeds, for I know for their seed, for I know their imagination which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. All right, keep reading. And Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. And he now, gave Joshua the, Go ahead. The, the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of good courage. For thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. 
And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of, the, of Yahweh, your Elohim, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Now listen, I know that he's telling them that that book of the covenant is a witness against them. I'm talking about mm -hmm. not just the people, but even the Levites. The Levites were set up back there. You read about it in the book of Leviticus, that their job was to teach the people those things that were that Yahweh had spoken from Mount Sinai so that they would not, as it were, forget it or bear it to mind. So their job was to, to discern and tell these people the difference between right and wrong. And that's in Leviticus 10.10, 10, where that they might put difference between unclean and clean, and that which is acceptable and that which is not. Now, here's what, uh, keep reading there where you were at, because this is what Moses is going to tell them. Read. In 27, For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck, Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, ye have been rebellious against Yahweh, and how much more after my death. Mm -hmm. Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will be fall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of Yahweh to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Mm -hmm. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. All right, now listen. Here, they are basically warned and being told that they're going to be uh, as it were, the Levites, actually, uh, the priesthood, became corrupt once they got into the land of Canaan. They actually despised the name of Yahweh and stopped teaching the people in that name. And Yahweh also talks about, over in the prophets, how that uh, they caused the people to not have, uh, uh, that, uh, not have knowledge, and for that reason, because they weren't teaching this knowledge to the people, that the people were put into captivity. Now, we know that this stuff is already set up. Yahweh's showing Moses and telling him this before the people go into the land of Canaan. Now, here we got to fast forward because I'm fighting on this clock, and I want to go down to uh, here. I want to go into the book of Matthew for a minute. Now, let's not forget something. Let's not forget that when the Messiah came in, that he was there at the end. I can't get my, my book to work right here. He was there at the end of an age. The age had not yet changed. The law was still in effect when Yahshua was born. Christianity wants you to believe that when Jesus was born, that was the beginning of Christianity, but it wasn't. It was him fulfilling as a Hebrew or a Jew those things that were set up under that first covenant. Yahshua came to finish something, not to start something. Now, here he's telling the apostles, and I want to go to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Let's start at 13. Okay, 7 and 13. Enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be who go in that way. Because narrow is the gate, and hard is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, if you look up that word find, it, you would have the impression when you read that, that you went out looking for it, and oh, I found it. But really, the word find means to see or to perceive. In other words, many people can come down and hear these things taught and never really see the reality of what this teaching is all about. And that's why many are seeking this. Many people come to class and many have left over the years because they don't see 
the spiritual reality of what this class or this teaching is really all about. Now, that's because it takes the Holy Spirit to open it up to you and make you understand it. Keep reading now. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ra uh, ravening wolves. Now, here, Yash was warning them. He's warning them that there's going to be false prophets that are going to be dressed in sheep's clothing. And another place he talks about these the same idea how that these wolves, these grievous wolves, will enter into the congregation. Now that's because back there in the law, when Moses came up out of Egypt and Pharaoh and his hosts were destroyed in the Red Sea, Dr. Kinley said that you cannot drown a satanic spirit with water. All they did when, when Yahweh closed that sea in on Pharaoh and his hosts, those demonic spirits that were incarnated in those bodies were disembodied and followed Israel right into the wilderness, just the way the doc explained it, and entered into those Israelites that would rise up against Moses and continuously create uh, uh, divisions and cause uh, accusations to be made and those things that you read about down there in the book of Numbers where they were constantly not going, they were going against Moses and what Yahweh was commanding him to do. To the point where when they actually spied out the land and came back, only two of the 12 spies brought back a true report. That was Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 spies said, nope, we can't go up there. There's giants up there. We can't defeat them. And Joshua tried to address the people and tell them that Yahweh would fight for them and he would overcome them. And then they later wanted to stone Joshua for saying those things. Now, what I want you to know is Joshua warned the apostles that there would be grievous wolves entering into the congregation or into the flock and they would be dressed in sheep's clothing, meaning that they looked like believers on the outside, but inside they were ravenous wolves. And so what I want you to know is Dr. Kinley, when he made the statement to us that I'm raising up both mysteries sitting right down here in this congregation, that there are those that are sitting in class right next to somebody else, learning the same things, hearing the same things, that later would pervert the doctrine and try to heap up followers unto themselves rather than recognizing that all of us have to put all of our trust and confidence and worship Yahshua the Messiah or the Holy Spirit, which is Yahshua. And it's not about an individual being higher or better or greater than somebody else that's sitting in the room. Now, we've seen this happen, where the very doctrine that is being taught has been perverted, just as they perverted the law after they went into uh, Canaan's land. Uh, they also uh, uh, threw the law out. There was uh, many years where nobody was even taught the law, and you can read about that in the books of the prophets. I don't have time to go in there and get it out right now. But what I want you to know is this. Here we go. We have the first covenant moved out of the way. Uh, let me go over here to this chart. <laughs> now, Yahshua nailed this old covenant to the cross, meaning that's where it ended. None of these forms of worship were any longer valid, and none of these things would be to the saving of your soul. Now, under the new covenant, we realize that that New Covenant is not according to the old. Paul was a Pharisee. He was raised under a famous teacher of the Pharisees named Gamaliel. And he was learned in the scriptures. He knew the scriptures uh, backward and forward, so to speak. And he was out there, of course, trying to propagate the idea of you establishing your own righteousness. Which is what the Jews were doing. For 1,500 years, they were trying to establish their own righteousness. And by doing that, that would gain them eternal life. Now, Paul then came clean in the seventh chapter of Acts of the Apostles. No, I'm sorry, seventh chapter of Romans. And talked about what was going on in him before he had the Holy Spirit. 
how that he had not known sin except the law said thou shalt not covet. And that the more he tried to keep the law, the more he was failing. And the things that he would tell other people that they had to do, he wasn't doing them himself. And you can read it for yourself in that seventh chapter. And he goes on in conclusion in that chapter to say, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this sin, from this death uh, 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 and no righteousness? Because as Paul points out in his epistles, that under the law, they were required to keep every single law, or they, if they broke one, they had no righteousness. He said that he thanked Yahweh through Yahshua, in other words, because he received, as it were, the law of the spirit of life that came from Yahshua the Messiah that freed him from the law of sin and death. Now that law basically is the new covenant that we're talking about over here. Now the reason is, is because Yahweh at Jeremiah told him he was going to write his laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And he tells them in Ezekiel, 36th chapter, that he would give them a new heart and a new spirit and cause them to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments. Now, under the new covenant, you do not go about to earn your own righteousness. What has to happen is that the gospel as it is preached has to be opened up to your heart and mind and understand it. It has to be revealed that will cause because of that revelation, changes to take place within a person's very soul or within their nature. And you will become a partaker of the divine nature. Now, the divine nature, which is what we say are those attributes. Uh, let me click on that chart. Uh, I want this understood. I know we have people listening that don't necessarily have as strong of a foundation, but these divine attributes that are painted up here in the cloud, these were put into a configuration. The attributes were configured in portion from Yahweh through this embodiment so that that would show forth a divine nature that represented Yahweh in this state of pure spirit. Now, that nature is a law in itself. Now, we read over there where Paul talks about how that owe no man anything but this, that, that you should love one another because law, the love is the fulfilling of the law, meaning the very attribute of love is a law in itself that will cause a person not to do ill will towards their neighbor. I'm using that as an example, but you can read about it over there. Now, the first law that was given to the Jews back here, uh, uh, the greatest, was that thou shalt love Yahweh with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy might. That cannot be fulfilled with a carnal nature. You need to have that Holy Spirit, and, and, and uh, Andy got up here and talked about how you can't bear fruit of yourself. Now, the fruit of the Spirit are the uh, byproducts and the divine nature itself and what it causes in you to be demonstrated and the changes it will do to your very soul or your nature. This is the law of the spirit of life that is now in us under this new covenant that's being written in our hearts. Now that is given to you by the Holy Spirit. It's a gift and it is causing you to walk correctly and properly not only in how you conduct yourself, but in your understanding of the things that we are, you're learning down here in class. It will keep you, as it were, on the straight path and cause you to know Yahweh and understand his doctrine. And that is the Holy Spirit causing that to occur within each and every one of us. And as Rick had said, that we have to have faith under this covenant. Well, that faith is an automatic uh, a byproduct of having the divine nature in you. If we love Yahweh, then of course we're going to have faith in him. If we uh, uh, love Yahshua, then, and we love the truth, that is going to generate us to have faith. And that faith is trust. 
And it's based on, and I, I like what Rick talked about in, in, over there in 1 Corinthians 15, when he had read that, uh, you know, this is the first thing I taught you unless you believed in vain. Now, believing in vain means you accepted something, as it were, with a belief that had no substance to the belief. Now, what is the substance of believing under the new covenant? It is that Yahshua shows you the witnesses and reveals to you with evidence that what you're believing is true. And that then causes the belief never to be overcome by the mystery of iniquity because the evidence, the witnesses, they validate that what your belief is is absolutely reality and true. And it cannot be defeated by the devil. But if you don't have the witnesses for yourself and you are not, as it were, confident in the things that you're learning because you haven't investigated or you haven't had the things opened up and revealed to you, then your belief is is, is based on uh, emptiness. You don't have substance to your belief. And that's what would cause you to become an apostate, which means you'll then renounce something that you once said you believed. Now, we don't want that to happen down here at the end of the age. But now here's how it's going to happen. Yahshua told us that there's going to be grievous wolves that will come into the congregation. And who do wolves devour? If you look at it in nature, they devour the young and the old and weak. That's what they're trying to do is devour those that don't have, as it were, the strength to be able to overcome them. That's what a wolf does. Now, here's what we have to know. We have to know that an oftentimes in nature, those that are strong in the pack will stand in defense of the young so that the wolves don't devour them. Now, what we do is we come to class here, those of us that have been given an understanding to continuously preach this gospel to renew your confidence in what you've learned down here. And as it was said, these are not cunningly divided fables. There is evidence that supports it. And once that evidence takes hold in your heart, you can stand on your own two feet and challenge the world, and nobody will ever move you off of those things you now believe because you have the confidence in the evidence of Yahweh's purpose as it was witnessed down through the scriptures, the law and the prophets. That's why Yahshua said, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Why is that? Because belief based on witnesses is not vain. It cannot be overcome or done away with. And even in your own heart, when you have the times that you're feeling, I'll put it this way, a little bit down, and feeling maybe a little... Uh, uh, not feeling as, as lifted up and spiritual as you have felt maybe at another moment in your uh, tenure in this teaching. And the devil starts to come at you to try to raise doubt within you. Here's what happens. You fall back on those witnesses that you have known and checked out for yourself that you know are true, and you hang on to those things because you see they cannot be denied, they can't be refuted, they can't be argued with. Your nature now is to love the truth. Therefore, once you know this is truth, I cannot deny it, you will use that to be able to fight off and stand against the devil. Now, in your own human body, when your immune system finds an invader that is coming in your body that disguises itself this is what viruses do. They try to get into the cells and manufacture from a cell more viruses. What the immune system has to do is recognize the deception of what's going on there so that it knows how to attack the virus and kill it and, and get rid of it. So this is what we have to understand. There is spiritual doctrine that is of Yahweh, and then there's the doctrine of men and the doctrine of devils. Those two doctrines are not based on solid witnesses in the law and the prophets. They're based on interpretations of things that they read in the Bible. You have to have an ability to discern the difference between something that is true 
and something that is uh, strong, that it's Yahweh's thoughts, it's Yahweh uh, manifesting and demonstrating that principle, or whether it's the thoughts and opinion of people that are getting up and teaching things based on how they deductively reason something. Those things are not witnesses. And Dr. Kinley said this, he said, I don't appreciate you going along with something just because I said it if it's not real with you. Now, what makes it real is when you see the proof for yourself and you know it's true and you're not believing it now because Doc said it. You're believing it because it's true, because the evidence supports it. And we all need to do that because otherwise you will not discern when a grievous wolf comes in dressed like a sheep, you'll be led away by that 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 wolf. And what that wolf wants to do is pervert your understanding and make you think that they are special so that you will then cling to them and look for them to lead you unto salvation. And that's where we don't want to do that. All of our confidence has to be put in the spirit of Yahshua, not in a physical person. And that includes Dr. Kinley. Doc said is not a witness. Neither is quoting a transcript. Those are okay to quote Doc, to, 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 to quote a transcript, but you still got to go back in the Law and the Prophets to validate it and back it up so that people see that it's coming from Yahweh himself. Now, one of the reasons Dr. Kinley told us to make him prove it, because as he showed us what his doctrine was, he was able to go back and lay it out for you right in your Bible. And then people would get mad, and Doc used to say this. He said, now listen, don't get mad at me. He said, I'm just showing you what's in your Bible. The reason why a lot of people leave this teaching, and they have been given this opportunity, Dr. Kinley said, if anybody thinks that what I'm teaching is wrong, and you can get up here and show me how I'm wrong out of the scriptures, we'll give you that opportunity to stand up and nobody's going to interrupt you, nobody's going to uh, uh, heckle you or anything like that, you will be able to get up and present your evidence and then let the body weigh the evidence as to what is uh, strong witnesses and what is, uh, as it were, imaginations that have been uh, perverted. And so I'm telling you right now, there's grievous wolves in the congregation. And Paul, at, all, at, at, at first when Pentecost uh, occurred, and they began to preach. There were those that were in the, the sect of the Pharisees, and that's, you can read about that in the 15th chapter of Acts, that became members of the assemblies that were preaching Yahshua. And there was also Sadducees that became members and so-called believers in Yahshua's resurrection. Now, here's what happened. The Pharisees, when the Gentiles came in, started to say that the Gentiles had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. So in the 15th chapter of Acts, they went in there. The apostles convened, I'll call it a convention, and they discussed whether they should tell the Gentiles to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. And after it was all talked about, that said that the Holy Spirit directed them, basically, to, to not lay those things on them. And Peter said, why would we lay these burdens on the Gentiles when we ourselves were not able to bear them? That is to say, to keep the law. And we will, and it, so they, they nixed that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. That was taken out. Now, the Sadducees started their own little thing. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. They ended up saying they accepted that Yahshua rose from the dead, but then they started saying as time went on that nobody else is resurrecting, that the resurrection was past. And that's what the whole chapter, the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is addressing. Now, how do you resolve that? by going back in the Law and the Prophets and seeing that Yahweh set up manifestations such as the tabernacle that was given for those that had died. What do you mean died? In the law, it says that, that uh, the, law, the, the wages of sin is death. So when the people sinned, every one of them were spiritually dead. Not to speak of that Adam was dead for partaking of that fruit and all of mankind was dead. But Yahweh set up the tabernacle, which was a way that those dead people could be atoned for 
and be restored back to life with Yahweh through the sacrifice of that lamb and the blood of the lamb. That was a, and listen, so in other words, the whole purpose of the tabernacle was not for Yahshua to show that he has the power to rise from the dead, but for him to show you that he has the power to raise you from the dead. He's not proving anything to himself. He's proven to you that you can have confidence in him that he will raise your soul up from a dead state to a living state. And that's what all these witnesses down through the law and the prophets are pointing to. Now, that, those witnesses is how you overcome false doctrine and how you cast off the works of the devil and his perversion of the gospel of salvation. And there are grievous wolves. And don't think just because somebody's a member of an organization makes them to be okay. We got both mysteries right down here with us every time we have a convention or we have a gathering. There's going to be the mystery of iniquity there as well. And there was right there, as we used to call the room that they had class in L.A., it was called at 1040 Grand Avenue, and we nicknamed it 1040. There was satanic spirits sitting right in 1040 every class. And some of them were actually asked to get up on the floor. And some of them taught things when Dr. Kinley was alive that was basically uh, a Paul parroting what he said. But after Doc died, all of a sudden, all of these other things started to be taught that Doc never said. And Doc warned us right there in December of 1975. He was telling us the same thing that Moses told the uh, uh, people and what Yahshua warned the apostles about the grievous wolf. He said, now listen, there's somebody who's been sitting down here for a long time, primarily raised up right in this teaching, that's going to get up here and teach you something different than what I've taught you. He said, now I'm not kicking about it. He said, but I'm telling you so you're prepared to reject it. And that's what we have to be willing to do, is reject any doctrine that contradicts what the founder had taught us. Now, here's what I mean by that. He said, if you're going to get on the floor and teach something, show your witnesses in the law and the prophets. And if you don't do that, you have no business teaching it. And if you people are sitting in the chair accepting things without witnesses, he said, now that's wrong too. He said, you don't have to believe and accept anything that has not been proven by the law and the prophets. Now, well, I'm out of time. I'm sorry I went over. But this is what this whole chapter, in my summation, uh, caused me to have and think, because I was reading this chapter earlier in the week, and I said, you know, we're going to get into this stuff. And I want you to know that at this time, we can't afford to be taken away from the law, the rules that the founder gave us, that it's got to be established in the Law and the Prophets. We don't want to hear your theories or your opinions or interpretations of anything. We want you to show us how Yahweh has shown that principle that you're teaching to be valid according to what he laid down in the scriptures. With that, sorry for going over. I'll hand it back to the moderator. Peace in Yahshua and love to all the brethren. Thank you, Dr. Volpe. We'd like to thank everybody who joined us today on our Zoom class. And we'd also like to thank those who have viewed us on YouTube. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. At this time, I'd like to ask the class to stay muted until the live stream has ended. We'll now be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.